Isaiah chapter 44. We're considering uh, this evening verses 21 to 28 under the title, Things Worth Remembering. Things Worth Remembering. So far, this has been a year that many want to forget. They want to put behind the trials of this year, but trials are good for us. We must, in fact, remember these things and learn from them. We are to learn from the good as well as the bad. Israel was a forgetful nation. One of her great sins and cause of her sin in the nation was their forgetfulness of God's works for them. We read in Psalm 78 and verse 10, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Verse 42 of the same Psalm, they remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. And in Psalm 106 verse 13, they soon forgot his works They waited not for his counsel. Let us consider in our passage this evening three points. We want to consider the principle, which is to remember. The praise for redemption and then the proclamation by or of the Redeemer. So first of all, the principle, which is to remember. Our problems always start when we fail to remember the wonderful works of God to our souls. The first two verses in our passage, verses 21 and 22, provide a sort of an overture, to use an operatic term, for the rest of the passage. We have briefly in these two verses what is worked out in the rest of the remaining verses. Notice, first of all, the exhortation to remember. It is simply, verse 21, remember these. Attention is being brought not only to the words, but the worth of these words, not just to read them, not just to hear them, but to remember them. As we considered this morning, to meditate on these things to give ourselves wholly to these things, to study these things, so that these things remain in our heart, our minds, and our souls. It is a clear sign of unbelief when we easily forget the Lord. He never forgets us. We so often forget Him in our folly. Back in our Later on in Isaiah, in chapter 49, in verse 16, we read this of the Lord. Behold, I have graven thee, I have inscribed thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. He does not forget us. We are his people. And not only is this poetic language, but when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, in a sense, we were literally graven on the palms of his hands. The exhortation to remember a God who never forgets us, the one that is the Redeemer. O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. We are to remember we are the redeemed, and therefore we are to remember our God. Thirdly, why we are to remember him. He is our maker. I have formed thee. We are his people. Thou art my servant, O Israel. We are precious to him. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. And also he has saved us from our sins. Verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So this call to remember, this plea, if you like, to remember, 
is the call of our God, our Maker, our Redeemer. This is not a call to religious observance. This is a call to worship. This is a call to remember God. And once we remember him, once we meditate upon what he has done for us, worship will be, as it were, natural. Not that worship is natural, it's supernatural, but it will become easy for us. We don't have to make up reasons why we worship God. We worship God simply for what he has done. The reason the world does not worship him is because the world has no knowledge of who he is and what he has done. We were watching a documentary that was made, I think, last year, and it was on creation. Wonderful documentary. And it just lays before us the the glories of the Creator, the one who made us, the one who formed us, and the one who is worthy of our praise. Revelation chapter 4 is that principle. So in those two chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5, we worship God, the Creator, Revelation 4, and we worship Christ, the Redeemer, in Revelation chapter 5. Often in Scripture, these two go together. God our Maker, God our Redeemer. We are twice His. We are made by Him and we are bought by Him. We are the twofold possession of God by creation and by grace. So the principle to remember. And then secondly, the praise for redemption. Just one verse, verse 23. And notice four things in this 23rd verse it is first of all the glory of praise it is sing o ye heavens the the glory of god's praise is not something that's to be done in a corner it's not something that is to be done secretly it's to be done openly just like daniel goes into his room and opens the windows wide and prays to his God. It is sing, O ye heavens, praise the God who made heaven and earth. Singing quite often, isn't it the truest expression? We, we sing about the things that we really feel. If we really rejoice or are glad about something, we sing about it. And therefore the scripture says that he has put a new song in our mouth. Praise to our God. The glory of praise. There's something glorious just in the act of praise. And especially when it's of the glorious one. And then secondly, the focus of praise Again in the 23rd verse, for the Lord hath done it. This is God's work. It is marvelous in our eyes. The glory of the one that we praise, we focus, we look to him. We worship the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. But then thirdly, the universal joy of of praise. Again in the same verse, shout ye lower parts of the earth. The contrast here with the heavens. It's sing, O heavens. Now it's shout ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. Not that literally the, the inanimate objects, uh, worship God literally as we do. But the, the picture here is that, is that God is worthy of praise even from the mountains, from the trees, from the lower parts of the earth. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, it says in the psalm. Everything, everyone, in all places, in all times, in all circumstances are to praise God. Even Job in the, uh, the beginning of the book of Job. After Job learns of the loss, not only of his possessions, but also of his children, he says, The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, because it is always suitable to praise God. He is always 
worthy of our praise. You see, this makes the difference between those who just praise God when the circumstances are good, when the circumstances are favorable to them. No, God is to be praised at all times, in all circumstances, and in all uh, and for all reasons. And then, fourthly, the reason of praise, specifically the reason of praise in this verse. For the Lord hath, it's a past event, not the Lord is trying to redeem Jacob, but the Lord hath redeemed Jacob. We notice, get this point, this is really important. Redemption and salvation in Scripture is always an accomplished act. Man does not save himself. Man does not save himself from his sins. God saves us. It is the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. It is the Lord's work. The Lord never fails. When somebody says, can I lose my salvation? We need to go back. We need to take a step backward and say, what is salvation? Salvation in its very nature is the work of God. And therefore, to say I can lose something that God does is folly. We only make the mistake by asking the wrong question. When we say, can I lose my salvation as if it's something that I got in the first place, that's where we're wrong. The Lord is the one who begins the good work in us, and he will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. It is his work from first to last, from beginning to end, it is the work of God. Praise for redemption. And then thirdly, in verses 24 to 28, the proclamation by the Redeemer. The proclamation by the Redeemer. And and in these verses now we have worked out, uh, fleshed out a bit more what we saw in the first couple of verses. Notice this proclamation is the word of the Lord. It is, thus saith the Lord. We have that, I think it's 400 times in the Old Testament, I think, from memory. But it's many times this phrase, thus saith the Lord. The New Testament equivalent is, it is written. You never have thus saith the Lord in the New Testament. So these two phrases are... Uh, are um, to be found one is to be found in the old and one is to be found in the new thus saith the Lord and it is written it is the word of God we sang or we we said in our call to praise in Psalm 138 for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name God magnifies his word God elevates his word even above his name so that we, we worship God when we honor his word in the very highest level. That God's word is the supreme thing. God elevates his character by elevating his word above all else, even above his name. It is the word of the Lord. But then it is the proclamation, again, of our Redeemer. It is personal. It is thy Redeemer. He belongs to us. We possess him as our Redeemer. It is personal salvation by a personally devoted and committed God. Again, it's the proclamation of our Maker. It is he that formed thee, again, very personal. It is he that formed thee from the womb. Just like Jeremiah. From the very womb God had chosen him. Again we must say here. The abhorrence and the evil of abortion. God is the one who forms the baby in the womb. From the very moment of conception. This is God's work. Abortion is one of the most satanic and devilish attacks upon the work of God in this world. It is the work of Satan, and all who carry out that work are co-workers with the devil. God is the maker of our being, as Psalm 139 reminds us in the secret places. 
we are wrought in the secret places. We are wonderfully formed by the Lord. Fourthly, he's the maker of all things. I am the Lord that maketh all things. Without anybody's help that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. It's by himself he has done this. That spread it abroad the earth by myself. This proves the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know from other scriptures that the the Lord Jesus Christ was, was the one who made the worlds. Without him nothing was made that was made in Colossians. By him all things were made. For and not just by him, but for him. So God stretched forth the heavens alone. It proves the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also of the Holy Spirit, because we read of the Spirit of God moving in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of God moving or literally brooding upon the face of the deep. God made all things without help by himself that spread it abroad the earth by myself fifthly it's of the one that confounds the wicked notice in verse 25 god confounds the wicked in a fourfold fashion he frustrates the tokens of the liars he frustrates their their um their intent and their schemes. He makes the diviners mad. He, he turns the wise men backward. As we read in scripture. He turns the counsel of Ahithophel to foolishness. He makes their knowledge foolish. You see we look at the world don't we. And we, we feel unable to challenge the world. We feel unable to fight the world. But listen. God himself does it. Even in this year, even in the circumstances that we find ourselves in this year, we don't need to fear. We don't have to come up with all the answers. We just have to be faithful to the God who will frustrate, the God who will make them mad, the God who will turn wise men backward and make their knowledge foolish. This is God's work. Just as salvation is God's work, this confounding is God's work. The the same God who loves Jacob hates Esau. He is the God of election and he is the God of reprobation. This is the God that we worship. This is our God. This is our Savior. This is our King. This is our Lord. This is our Maker and Redeemer. Sixthly, it's of the one, it's the proclamation of the one that confirms his people. Verse 26. It's wonderful, actually, in verse 26. Look what it says. It says that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers. It's wonderful, God's word. We we preach God's word, but as we preach God's word as his servants, God confirms and God performs. We were talking about prayer, weren't we, this afternoon? And... You know, the whole, lots of issues with prayer. But as we were saying this afternoon, prayer is not about getting man's will done in heaven. It is about seeing God's will done on earth. And in prayer, we can only be confident when we're praying according to the will of God. And we can only be confident that God will confirm our word, and perform our counsel as his messengers and servants when we are proclaiming his word. This is the confidence that, again, that we spoke of this morning, that we can have courage and and confidence and conviction and comfort and all those words and all those ideas when we are preaching his word, when we're proclaiming simply what the Lord has said, what the Lord has proclaimed, and then the Lord comes with us and in us and by us and he confirms that word and he performs that counsel this is the union between god and his people between god and his servants he is the one it's the proclamation of the one seventhly that constructs his church 
the one that builds his church. Look at verse 26, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Have you not already thought of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, I will build my church? Again, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Godhood of the man, Christ Jesus. I will build my people. I will build my church. There is inhabiting, there is building, there is raising up. God is in the work of building his people. We are not dependent upon man. We are not dependent upon our own wisdom, our own ability. We just need to be faithful. What's so lacking in the church today is a lack of trust in the the means and the methods that God has given to us. Just be faithful. God is jealous over his worship and he is jealous over the means of his grace the church is failing fundamentally and basically because it's simply not trusting the means that god has given the proclamation of the proclaimer the one who has proclaimed not only the word but the means by preaching of that word We live in desperate times because in desperation, not the world, the church has turned to worldly methods. So instead of churches being devoted courageously and boldly to the proclamation of God's word, it becomes a social center. Youth groups, not that having the youth together is a bad thing, but when that becomes the main thing, when that becomes the activity of the church, rather than proclaiming our God. How beautiful are the feet of him that brings good news, that proclaims glad tidings to Zion, that saith, your God reigns. This is what the church is to do. This is the power. This is the power of the church to proclaim the word of the Lord, the thus saith the Lord. The church has lost. The church has lost its power because it has lost the thus saith the Lord and has turned to inventions. It's turned to folly, to foolishness, to its own imaginations, its own dreams and sin. And that's why We need to preach the word, especially in these times. If ever we need to preach the word of God, it's now. Eighthly, it's the proclamation of the one that constrains the very elements, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Our God is in control of all things. He's not the deistic God who starts the ball rolling, who, who the clockmaker, you know, just starts it off. No, no, he is the creator and he is the governor of all things. At his will, rivers dry up. At his, at his will, there's floods. At his will, there's earthquakes. At his will, the sun shines. The rain falls. The wind blows. All at his will. All by his control and providence. Ninthly, it is the proclamation of the one that calls effectually. Verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, the Persian king. The Persian king becomes the shepherd of God and shall perform all my pleasure, everything that I have called him to do. He is my servant he is my shepherd to shepherd my people back to jerusalem to build my church this is the same god that still rules the affairs of man that's why we don't need to panic we do not need to panic 
We simply must rest in the Lord and the sovereign purposes of God. The one who controls heaven and earth, the maker and sustainer and providential keeper of all things. And that rules even in the kingdoms of men. And then lastly and tenthly, the proclamation of the one that confirms his promise to his people. It sort of sums it all up at the end of verse 28. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. It's the absolute promise of a covenant keeping God. Never will I leave thee. Never will I forsake thee. Thou art my people. Thou shalt be built. Thou shalt praise my name. And I will do all my purpose. What confidence this gives us. What courage. What conviction. What comfort. These are the comfort chapters. Chapters 40 through 45 are the comfort chapters we've called them. These six chapters. What comfort this gives to us. Thou shalt be built. Thy foundation shall be laid. Of course, this was fulfilled literally, physically, but it was fulfilled in a greater way. As we read in Ephesians chapter 2, that the apostles are the foundation of the church, the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The foundation has been laid As somebody wrote poetically in the words, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, the Lord. And no other foundation can be laid that is laid, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let us stand on that sure foundation. Let us trust on the rock bed of Christ. And let us stand on his word as wise men and women. And we shall not be moved we shall not be ashamed when we trust in him the lord bless his word to our souls in the savior's name amen amen let us conclude with psalm 85 psalm 85 will sing verses 1 to 7 Psalm 85, verses 1 to 7. O Lord, thou hast been favorable to thy beloved land. Jacob's captivity thou hast recalled with mighty hand. Thou pardoned thy people, hast all their iniquities. Thou all their trespasses and sins hast covered from thine eyes. Psalm 85, verses 1 to 7. O Lord, thou hast been favorable. Savior, my 
show mercy to us for the sake and glory and honor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ show mercy to thy people build us O God build thy church we give thanks that the foundation has been laid which is Jesus Christ we pray that the blessed Holy Spirit would continue that work in these days building, confirming, confounding the enemy, setting at naught the wisdom of the so-called wise, and manifesting the glory of Jesus Christ in his church, the wisdom of God, showing foolish the wisdom of man. Bless us, bless thy people, forgive all our sins for Jesus' sake. And now the grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.